Good morning, everyone. Good to have you here. Good to see a little bit of sunshine, isn't it? Isn't it, isn't it good to know that someone south of us is getting way more snow than we're getting? So, <laughs> hallelujah. We won't, we won't uh, be bothered by that at all. You folks in Chicago, good for you, you know? It'll, it'll make you start singing Christmas songs again or something <laughs> like that. Well, I'd like you to remain seated. As we sing, stand up for Jesus. Number 456, please turn to that if you would, please. Hymn number 456, stand up for Jesus. And by the way, one of the reasons why we are seating is just, it's the whole viral thing to keep it from spreading out even further. But let's sing this together, 456. draw people to uh, be interested in the gospel and that we'd be able to uh, share with them at some point in time and see you work in their lives. Uh, thank you, Lord. Use us for that. I pray that you'll bless our service now. Uh, use the singing to encourage us, Father, to cause our hearts, hearts to truly worship you. Uh, use our fellowship to uh, encourage one another and to be sh iron sharpening iron. And as we look into your word, I pray that you would especially uh, work in each of our hearts, help us to apply it, and uh, live out the things that you've left us to do. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And go through a, a few announcements here. First of all, I have a card that I'd like to read. This comes from Lynn, and uh, you just recently gave her a birthday card and a birthday gift last week. She says, Dear Church Family, thank you for the nice card and generous birthday gift. Your thoughtfulness in this tangible way was a real encouragement. Each of you are a real blessing in my life. Thank you, love, Len. So thank you very much. She did uh, greatly appreciate that. Now, a couple other things. Uh, Lynn has been working on this swag. Some of you know we were, she's made a swag that, that's 
made to fit into June Fisher's window down in the nursing home where she's at in Eaton Rapids. And uh, several of you gave flowers to go with that. Well, she used some of the flowers from each of you, and then now she has those here if you'd like those flowers back. So if you are interested in them, see Lynn afterwards, and she will get those things to you. And um, we had debated on surprising you or not, but we are, we are going to take them down and deliver them to June tomorrow, actually. Uh, we, called, we called the nursing home there. By the way, we're going to a conference, and that's on our way to our conference. We called the nursing home, and we can't go in and see her, but they're going to allow us to uh, deliver them to the nursing home. They'll take the stuff from us, and then they're going to allow us to walk around and stand outside her window and see her. And they said, we'll even open the window and let you talk and stuff. So we are going to you know, get to see June. So I'm just hoping that, that all of what, what you have all added to that will be a great encouragement to her. I'm sure it will be. Uh, uh, Lynn talks to her um, several times a week. I know several of the rest of you do too. And to me, she sounds pretty upbeat, sounds pretty positive. So uh, we're grateful for that. But uh, be praying for June Fisher. I know she would appreciate that. All right. Uh, we, of course, have our normal activities going on, Sunday school, Wednesday night uh, prayer meeting. Uh, remind you that those things are available for you. Uh, we do still have the sign-up sheet for anyone who would like to help out with the church cleaning at this point. And I want to remind you that today, following the morning service, we are going to have our annual business meeting. Now, we are intentionally keeping it shorter because of just, again, trying to limit the amount of time that we're together uh, because of virus concerns. But uh, we will be having that immediately <clears throat> following the service today. And then I have a letter I'd like to read to you. This comes from one of our missionaries. Uh, probably several of you were on the, the email list to get the, the letters from the Sturgeons down in Bolivia, but let me go ahead and read this to you. I just thought it was uh, pertinent and I didn't want to put it off too long. It says, we are embarking on a new year with positive anticipation, even though there has been a new wave of infection of COVID-19, but we are still looking forward to the new year with its challenges and blessings. Remember, they're down in Bolivia and their seasons are the opposite of ours. It's actually their summer down there right now. January was a little different for us because this is usually a busy month with summer camp, but it was canceled because of the virus. At the end of December, we finished up the life of Christ in the Bible Institute that we have in our church, and four of our members finished the course, and they did very well. Last week, we began the course Knowing Your Bible, course one, with five students, and we're very thankful for the interest that our members are showing in learning more about the Bible. We're scheduled to begin classes at the seminary at the beginning of March, but because of the pandemic, new restrictions are instituted, so we're not sure what's going to happen at this time for the seminary. We will have services once a week on Sunday mornings, and I send out by, by recording our Wednesday services. We can still have the institute on Thursday because we are within the curfew, and we are thankful for the ministries that we have and for the participation of our membership. Bob and Terry Sturgeon. Yeah, I mean, we might not like some of our restrictions, but they actually have a curfew there. It would have to be off the streets, so interesting. And then they sent a number of prayer requests, and I'll read them because I know several of you have been praying for them. First of all, that the virus will be reduced and eradicated with the new vaccine. Pray for Gustavo and his church. Remember last time we were praying about some uh, problems where there was a wolf in sheep's clothing coming in trying to take over some things. Um, uh, pray for the political situation in Bolivia and in the United States. That's what he, that's funny, down in Bolivia, they're worried about us up here too. Church services and the Bible Institute to be able to continue. And then salvation for Baymar, Annette, and their children. Salvation for Junior and Rosemary, owners of the hardware store in their village, and their children. And then pray for a fellow named Roger who has health issues and has been struggling with a drinking problem. So uh, do pray for those things. Uh, if you're not on their email list, we could, we could get you on their email list, and they, they'll send these out uh, at least once a quarter. Sometimes it's almost monthly, so I do continue to pray for the Sturgeons. I know that they would appreciate that. All right, I believe that's all of our uh, announcements and things. I want to remind you that the offering plates are there by the door, and uh, if the Lord has led you to give, that's where you would put those things. And also, again, the annual meeting is after our service this morning. We will dismiss and allow everyone to uh, get up and move around and so forth, and then we'll call everyone back together after a few minutes 
and uh, get going with our meeting again. Okay, let's sing another song. We are talking about uh, uh, being outreach oriented, about having the idea that we're, we think about that we should be uh, representing the Lord Jesus Christ and because there's people around us who need to know him and also being able to speak about that to people. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I chose some of these songs with the idea of you thinking about what, what has God done in your life? How has he prepared you for walking with him? Let's sing this first song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. So the Bible says that God has overcome this separation for us. 
what we couldn't do ourselves, uh, God has done through Jesus Christ. And Jesus paid the penalty of our sin. He died the death that we deserved in order that we could be with God. And so it's Jesus that has bridged this separation between us and God that was caused by our sin. We'll look at a few more ideas that uh, you might find helpful someday in sharing those things. Uh, let's go to our hymnals once again and sing another song. This time hymn number 546. I will sing the wondrous song. that I will see and remind me a story of a, of a, a little elderly woman. She was a, a godly woman. She uh, knew the Lord as her Savior. And uh, the problem is, is that she really lived long. You know how some people, uh, or how most of us will die in our 70s or 80s or something like that. I know some of you don't want to hear that. But this particular lady lived to be 112 years old. Well, when she finally passed, she went to heaven. And when she went to heaven, she saw uh, one or two family members that she, she wasn't sure that they were believers. She said, I'm so surprised to see you here. I'm glad that you're here, but I'm so surprised. And he said, hey, it had been so long, we didn't think you were coming here either. <laughs> Forgive me for that. I couldn't resist. I want to give you directions to get to a particular restaurant here in Grayling. Um, when you leave the church... You go out here, and you could turn right or you could turn left. Uh, let's say if you were to turn left, 
You could turn left, and then you see the highway up here. Get on the, uh, at the first on-ramp there, which is going south. Turn and go that way, and you'll go to the next exit, and that's called North Down River Road. So you're going to pull off there, and you're ready to turn. You know, it's kind of funny that it's called North Down River Road. Have you thought about that? It runs east and west. But it's called North Down River Road. Now that's because it's on the north side of the river and it does run east and west. So you're going to go, you're going to turn right, which is going west on North Down River Road. So I want you to go that way. And then you could turn on uh, another street, which I believe that would be, uh, that's, uh, what's the name of the road that goes to the hospital? Michigan Ave. Yeah, why didn't I think of that? It's a good thing I didn't say Ohio State or something like that. But you could turn there, and I could give you directions to go that way, but you know what? I, I don't even want to go there because that's a little more confusing. Instead, when you turn out of, the, of our uh, driveway here, go right instead and go down the road, and you'll come to a stop sign. At the stop sign, you're going to turn left. Now, if you were to turn right, it would take you past the high school. It would take you to Frederick. There's actually a couple other restaurants up there. But don't worry about it, because you're not going to turn right. I want you to turn left anyway. So you're going to turn left, and you're going to follow that around. Well, well as, you, as you come around, you're going to come to a cemetery there. You could turn left right there at that cemetery. That's actually North Down River Road. Remember, it goes east and west, not north and south. But you're going to turn east on North Down River Road if you went that way. And then you'll go up to Michigan Avenue. But don't, I don't even want you to go that way. Forget that way. Instead of turning there, just go straight. And you're going to keep on going straight, and you're going to come to, first of all, a traffic light. If you turn right, it'll take you to Traverse City and Calcasta. There's a lot of restaurants there, but that's not where I want to send you. So you're going to, you're going to kind of bear around to the left, but don't turn left, because that's Lake Street there. You want to just bear to the left and stay on the business loop. And you're going to go around. You're going to come to another stop sign, or not a stop sign, a traffic light. Well, that's the main business district. Actually, that's, uh, that's Michigan Ave right there that, that would have, you would have gotten on the other two ways that I could have told you how to get there. But don't, don't turn there. You just want to keep going straight. And then you're going to get to, uh, you're going to you're kind of loop around, you're going to cross the river, which, by the way, people take canoes going down that river. We have a big canoe race here every year. You ever seen the, the start there? They do a shotgun start. They're not chasing people with shotguns. They, they just, it's called a shotgun start. Well, anyway, you keep going past there, and you'll eventually come to another light. And at that light, you'll look on your left-hand side, and there's Burger King. So if you turn left, you can actually do two things. You can turn a quick left and turn around and come into their parking lot that way. Or you can turn left on 72 and then turn left again into their parking lot. Now, didn't I make that awfully confusing? <laughs> Couldn't I have just said, go to, the stop, go to the stop sign, hang a left, and go to the third traffic light and you'll see Burger King on your left? Couldn't I have just done that? Well, you know what? When we talk about sharing the gospel, sometimes we do that. Sometimes we feel like that this person has to know every biblical truth that I've ever learned in order for them to be saved. Is that really true? Well, we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about uh, our verbal witness and how, just how important that is. But let me just give you a hint. Uh, just give easy directions. I, I sometimes don't even like to ask for directions because people, when, when I traveled with a summer gospel team when I was in college, and people would say, oh, we know a shortcut. Here, do it. I thought, no, no. We're, not, we're not doing that. Just give me the map, because I was the navigator. Just give me the map, and we'll figure it out. So, all right. Um, at any rate, we're, we're in this series right now where we're talking about being outreach-oriented. Today, we're going to look at the idea of, of us actually having a verbal witness, uh, being able to talk. Last time we talked about our example. We need, to, we need to be living our lives as believers in a way that people can see that God's made a difference in our lives. Not that we're wacky, weird, standing on the street corners preaching on a soapbox, but just that they can see that, God, that something's happened, something is different about us, and, uh, and hopefully they'll understand that that was God doing that. So we have to have that example, and next time we're going to talk about the idea of showing mercy or showing good works. To people, that's kind of important as well. But today, I want to talk about your verbal witness. Your verbal witness and why that's important. Some people will say, I'm just going to live for God, I'm going to live a good life, and that'll point people to Jesus. Well, you know what? You can live a good life all you want, and it's not going to point people to Jesus. It might point people to religion. It might point people to uh, a moral, moralistic type of lifestyle. But at some point in time, you need to actually talk. You need to actually 
uh, say some things if anyone's going to get anything. I suppose you could hand a tract that shares the same thing, but it's still, the point is, words are important, and we need to be able to do those words. Well, I want, first of all, I want to look at, there's an emphasis on speaking when it comes to the gospel in the scriptures. I'm going to start in Romans. I'm in Romans chapter 10, and I'm, like I said, I'm going to flip back and forth between Romans and the book of Acts, and uh, I want to start in Romans chapter 10. Uh, I want to go down to verse 13. Paul, Paul is, by the way, he's making a large argument. The whole book of Acts is on the gospel and on people's need for salvation. But in verse 13, he says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? By the way, this isn't talking about a professional preacher, pastor type thing. It's, it's someone who's willing to preach or proclaim. And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. And you can go on. He says a lot more in that chapter. But just looking at what he says here in uh, verses 13 through 15, he asks a series of rhetorical questions. Now, I'm going to actually reverse it, because he starts at the end and kind of walks backwards. But if you reverse it, he says, first of all, we need to be sent. Are you sent to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yes, you are. Don't think of missionaries and pastors. Think of the fact that we all are told to proclaim. And I'm going to show you a little bit more about that as we go. Um, uh, then, then they can hear, but they actually have to hear. And then when they hear, then they've got something they can believe. And then they actually have to believe, and then they call on him. Have you ever thought about that? Before someone can call on the Lord for salvation, they have to believe first. Because what else would they be calling on, right? I mean, if you're going to ask God to save, you have to believe God can save. And, and that's the idea. And that's what Paul is getting across here. Um, true saving faith has content. There's content to it. It's not just a religious feeling. It's not just a religious notion. And there's all kinds of other things that people try to throw into the gospel. But the gospel has content. And we're going to look at that as we go. Salvation comes to those who hear and believe the facts of the gospel. All right? Now, there's two, two kinds of revelations that we talk about when we're talking theologically speaking. There's general revelation and there's special revelation. General revelation, Paul talks about it back in chapters uh, 2 and 3 of the book of Romans. General revelation are the things that God has created point toward him. You know, like God's creation, uh, nature, uh, even you, your physical body. I, I heard a thing one time where they just looked at one organ in your body, your eye, and all the minute things about making an eye an eye. Well, all that points to God as a designer. That's general revelation. But general revelation doesn't save anyone. No one gets saved because of general revelation. In fact, you could make the argument that all general revelation does is make it so that there's no doubt you're guilty. And, and, and deserve your punishment in hell. There won't be a single person in hell that doesn't deserve to be there. You might say, but what about those people who live in these faraway jungle places and they've never heard the name of Jesus? Well, they've heard general revelation. General revelation is there for everyone, and even that they reject. So if you reject the basic, you, you can't, you know, no one will be able to complain and say, no, 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 I didn't get enough. No, you did. That's what Paul argues in the book of Romans, chapters uh, 2 and 3 and 4. Now, uh, the next type of revelation is called specific revelation. And specific revelation is where God has revealed to us specific truth. And the gospel is part of that. And people have to know the specific truth. So it is important. There is an emphasis in the scriptures on speaking. I want to show you a couple other uh, ideas in the book of Acts, if you'll turn there now. I cheated. I marked a couple places so I can turn a little quicker. But in the book of Acts, you get to Acts on the, on the day of Pentecost where the disciples were in the upper room. And I'm in chapter 2. And you go to verse 4. It says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. By the way, when you talk about this whole idea of speaking in tongues, if you look at this passage, they weren't just going, la, 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 or, and they weren't just doing that. They were speaking in actual languages. And people from other regions around that part of the world could hear it in their own language. That's what they were actually doing. In fact, you go down to uh, verse 5, and it says that. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And then go down to verse 11, the second part of that. And it says, 
Uh, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And then if you keep reading that passage, uh, Peter stands up and preaches a sermon to them. And he gives them the specifics that they need to understand as far as the gospel is concerned. Speaking is important. Uh, if you turn over to chapter 8, we've got an Acts, go to Acts chapter 8, and here is a story about where Stephen is martyred. He's the first martyr of the church. In chapter 7, he preaches a sermon which shares the uh, facts of the gospel and so forth. Well, verse 1 of chapter 8 says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So all these people, the pe regular people of the church, were scattered, except for the apostles, who would have been the pastors, if you want to put it that way, uh, for that particular group. They were all scattered. Now go down to verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And again, if you don't like that word preaching because you're not a preacher, the, the word proclaiming would be a good word. There. They went everywhere proclaiming the word. You see, the point is they had to speak. People had to actually say some things. Uh, back in Acts chapter 4, you don't have to turn there, but just in Acts chapter 4, uh, when Peter, I think it's Peter and John who were before the Sanhedrin, and they were sharing about why they were doing what they were doing, and they were talking about Jesus, and he said, there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. You see, there's content to the gospel, and that content is important. And we need to verbalize it somehow, some way. Like I said, you could, like I said, you could give a track or you could have it written out or something of that nature. And, and that is very good as long as the actual facts are being given. But normally, we're speaking it. That seems to be the idea. And they certainly had to do it there. So let's get to this uh, point number two here. What should we say? Doesn't that generate just a little bit of fear amongst believers? Now, you might even think with me, because I'm a pastor and I've studied uh, these things, I mean, I've got a master's degree in divinity, if you want to uh, look at it like that. I, it should be easy, but I get fearful, too. I mean, there's people I work with or people that I'm around in other places, and the fearful part is, is okay, how would be the best way to do this? How would be the best way? Because I don't want to just, I don't want to be the person that is obnoxious about it, and every time people see me coming down the hall, they turn and go the other way. I mean, I, because that's no good. That's not helping anybody. I, I want to I be able to talk to people. Well, how do you do that? How would be the best way to do it? How would be the best way to get into it? So I understand there being fear there. Uh, I, I'm, some people are afraid, what if I get it wrong? Uh, what if I leave something out that, that is important? I'm not a minister. Well, we need to stop right there and set the record straight. You are a minister. If you, if you were to go to Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm not going to go there right now, but in verses uh, 11 and 12, it's talking about the fact that, that God brought pastors and other uh, teachers and so forth to the church. So this is why God has me here. He's got me here at the church. Why? What's the purpose? To, to, to train the saints in the work of the ministry, to prepare them for the work of the ministry. The emphasis there is that we're all ministers. You can't get around it. You are. Whether you're actively doing ministry or not is another story, but we are ministers. Now, you, you may not be getting paid for it. By the way, I appreciate uh, having a salary. I mean, that, that, that's all good. But we are all in the ministry. Now, think about this. What, what, what do I do? What, what should I actually say? Well, first of all, as you consider this, think about what do you base your salvation on? I mean, if I said to you, if you were to die today and you stood before God and God said, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? That, that will give you a good idea of what you're, you're going to base it on. What, what is the most important part? What, 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 is, what is important there? Um, did you uh, have to earn a divinity degree in order to get saved? How many here earned your Master of Divinity before you got saved? Oh, no one did. Uh, Carl earned his Master of Divinity, but that was after you're saved, right? Yeah. No, you didn't have to. How many of you think you could pass uh, an exam right now for the uh, Doctor of Divinity or Master of Divinity? Uh, none of us could, right? Um, you don't have to actually do that. But you got saved. Now, think about that word. You got saved. What, what, why the need for salvation? Well, somewhere along the line, you realized some facts, didn't you? You realized some things. And uh, I want us to talk about that. Basically, what did you do in order to get saved? 
Well, it's not so much what you did as much as the idea that you believe. Now, believe is an action verb, so you did that, but uh, you believed, okay? What was it that you believed? Uh, you think through those things, and that will help. Um, I want to look at a couple other people in the New Testament where we see these things happen. If you're still in the book of Acts, turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, by the way, is, is an amazing chapter. It starts with, uh, with the, uh, the lady Lydia, who got saved, one of the first converts recorded in Europe, uh, where she's saved, and then Paul and Silas are thrown in prison, and then you have the story of the Philippian jailer, and that's the one that I'm interested in right now. Uh, in the Philippian jailer, Acts chapter 16, go to verse 29. This is after the earthquake, and after he'd heard them singing all night, and he obviously heard things that they were talking about, but now he's coming in after they didn't leave when they could have, and this is where we find ourselves in verse 29. Then he called for a light, ran in, this is the Philippian jailer, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, you see that word, they're just telling them to believe, but there's a little more to it than that. There's more implied in that word believe. But look at verse 32. Then they spoke to him the word of the Lord. To, uh, they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. So they actually did share the facts. I mean, uh, Luke listed the general idea here that they said, be, "You need to believe on the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved." But then they went on and explained to him exactly what that meant. It, I, I wish it would have been recorded. I wish they would share to us exactly all the things that they shared with this guy, and they're questioning back and forth. By the way, some people will use this as an idea that infants can be saved. Once the father of the household gets saved, infants get saved. But if you'll notice, it says that uh, they spoke to everyone in the house. I'm sure Paul wasn't getting over the little five-week-old infant and preaching the gospel to him. No, it was everyone was able to hear and understand is, is what he's talking about here. Well, let me, let me continue on after verse 32. It says, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now, when he had brought them into the house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Now, again, it's not that he didn't rejoice because he was baptized and therefore going to heaven. He rejoiced because he believed. He got baptized because he believed, by the way. But uh, he believed in God with all his household. Again, no infants. They were all old enough to be able to have personal belief themselves. But they believed. And Paul and Silas explained to them and shared some things with them. Uh, there's another story, if you were to, we won't go there, but if you turn back to uh, Acts chapter 13, and I guess I am going to go there, Acts chapter 13, where Paul was on his first missionary journey, and uh, they're in Antioch and Pisidia, and uh, they're preaching, and he says here in verse 38 and 39, Paul says, Therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that though this man is preached to you, meaning Jesus, that, that, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And, and he explained to them the gospel. So these are instances of people who had to hear the facts in order to be saved. Now, what, what are the facts? What do we say? Well, I, mean, I like to look at it like, like this. What are the basics? Remember the story of me trying to give you directions? I don't know if I had you all turned around. Probably didn't have you turn around because you could all picture exactly what I was talking about. But I shared a bunch of stuff that someone who wasn't from here would have been all turned around, who didn't understand all that stuff, and wondering, why are you saying all that stuff to me? Yeah. Uh, how many of you get bothered when someone's giving you directions and they tell you turn west, turn north, turn east, and you're like, I don't know which way is west or east. I saw some guy who's a comedian saying, what do you think I am, Lewis and Clark? You know, uh, just tell me, right or left. And, uh, and, and I, I understand that. Although I, I love, with me, I can do that because I like to try to keep tabs on where's north, where's south, and so forth. You know, it really bugs me to be at the elementary school because the elementary school is on an angle. It should be north is that way, but no, that's northeast. North is more that way. And, and I mean, it's really, it's kind, of, it kind of gets me twisted around a little bit. I, they're, not, they're not set on north, south, east, and west. They need to rebuild that school, <laughs> is what I think. But, uh, but no. When it comes to the gospel, though, what are the basics that we need to share? Now, you need to remember this. 
The gospel is said that even a child can believe it. Childlike faith. It's simple enough that even they can hear the gospel and understand it. Think about this verse. Think about the verse John 3.16. Can you quote it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That was King James, by the way. I don't know if anybody else uh, learned it from another one. Most of us learned it from there. But yeah, it talks about the fact that God loved us. It talks about the fact that God gave his son. Now, the fact that he gave his son implies there was a need there involved, right? We know that. And then, whosoever believes. Well, I want to talk about this idea. What are, what are the basics? And uh, Bob, would you switch to the next slide? If you just want to know the basics, I'd encourage you, write this in the inside cover of your Bible, if it would help you. To me, it helps. God, man, Christ, faith. If you remember those, when I'm trying to share the gospel with someone, I think through those four things right there. God, man, Christ, faith. And, and I think that makes it pretty simple. Now, like in John 3.16, he didn't mention the first one about, that I'm going to mention about God here, God being holy. But uh, it's implied, or else why would there be a need? Why would he have to give his son? Well, let's, let's consider these four things. God, man, Christ, faith. First of all, God is love. God does love us. But you know what? No one's ever going to get to heaven because you tell them God loves them. They have to know more than that. Because not only does God love us, but God is holy and just and must punish sin. And we as human beings walk away from it. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. But God is holy and just. Sometimes we forget just how holy he is. We think it's enough to just love him. Because, because you know, if you love your kids, you just love your kids, right? But you know, there comes a point in time when you've got to put your foot down. And you've got to say, no, you can't be doing this. And, and you have to toe the line. And that's not always easy as a parent, is it? Well, God is, is kind of the same way. Yes, God loves us, but he is holy. He's perfect. And, and he can't just simply overlook sin. Sin has no place with him, is the idea, okay? And then the next one is man. Yes, God loves us, but we're sinners. We are sinners. You go back to the story of Adam and Eve, uh, humanity turned away from God. Uh, and you see it all throughout the rest of the scriptures, all the way up to uh, today. And you see it today, don't we? certainly see that people, we, we are all sinners. Now, we're not all as bad as it can be. This last week in school, I was, I was teaching a section all week long on human trafficking. And I'll tell you what, I felt like I was pulled through the pig pen. It needed to be taught. I found it interesting. There was one particular video we watched where a lady described what she went through. And when that video was done, these eighth grade kids just sat there. Every single class, they sat there quiet. I could tell it had an impact. It's dirty, icky, gross. Now, we may not be as bad as some of those people in that story, some of the people that were doing those things to that lady. Um, but we are all sinners. We are all sinners. We can't get around it. So yes, God loves us, but since we're sinners, God says we stand in line of judgment. We deserve his judgment. God can't just simply say, oh, I love you, you big lug. Come on up here, let me hug you. No. God says you're a sinner. You're dirty. Think about uh, when your husband's outside working in the backyard on that septic tank that had a problem and he fell in. And he comes in and you just say, oh, don't worry about it, honey. We'll clean the floors up later. <laughs> Not what you say. Undress out there and we'll spray you down with a hose. Yeah, you know, well, we don't, we don't realize just how holy God is. And sin is like that to him. Okay? Something's got to be done about it. We can't do anything about it. It's the way we are. That husband can sweet talk his wife all she wants, and she's going to say, no, you get the hope. <laughs> right? Well, the next thing is, is Christ. That's what God did about it. Uh, God sent Christ, who is God's son, of course, but God sent Jesus to die on the cross so that he could take your place. You deserve punishment. Christ took the punishment for you. And then when Christ was on the cross, God did pour out his wrath. God maintained his holiness and his justice by literally, actually pouring out his wrath. Your sins have been punished and judged. They were done on Jesus Christ. Jesus did that on our behalf. And then the idea of faith is that that's where the idea of believing comes in. We learn those facts. We accept those facts. We believe those facts. 
And that's when we turn to God and ask him to save us. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Please, Jesus paid for my penalty. Please forgive me of my sins. And he will, and he does. You see, that's, I, I think we can sometimes make the gospel really hard, but that's the simple part of the gospel. God, man, Christ, faith. And I even shared more than you have to share. You don't have to share even all of that. But people do need to know those things. They need to know that God is holy, and therefore sin is just to punish sin, our sin. And that God took care of it by sending his own son to do it for us. And then we receive that by faith. Well, what about, what about all the rest? What about all the rest of, of the gospel? You know, you, because the gospel really is simple, but the gospel is also intricate. And it, it is elaborate, if you will. What, what about all that? Um, let me ask you this. How much do you need to understand about your car before you can get in it today and drive you to church? Most of us just went out to the car, put the key in, started it. We know how to put it in drive and reverse, and we know how to use the brakes and the gas pedal, and we get to church, right? It's pretty simple. You know how, how intricate your car really is? You know all of your cars have computers in them? They do. I mean, it shocked me when I first learned that back 15, 20 years ago. My car has a computer? No, not mine. Yes, it does. Well, how come I can't play Atari on it or something? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but no, they're, they're intricate. And you don't have to know all that stuff. You just got to know that as long as you keep gas in it, change your oil once in a while, you can drive where you need to drive. When something does come up, you take it to the experts and let them take care of it a lot of times. That's how you'd want to do it. You don't have to know all that stuff. Uh, I'm back in Romans chapter 3. If you wanted to turn there for just a moment, I want to kind of give you an illustration of that. But in Romans 3, Paul is talking about the gospel. And when he, he's going to start in verse 21, he's going to mention some very simple things. He says in verse 21, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who, uh, let's see, who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's pretty simple. God has provided for our salvation. Now, that's even a little more intricate than what I was talking about with these four things, but it still is pretty simple. But if you keep reading, it suddenly gets deep. And you know, you know why God used Paul to write portions of the Scripture? Paul was a, was a um, uh, we, we say he was a lawyer. He was a lawyer in the law of, of the Old Testament. He understood the Scriptures, and he was very intricate-minded. And, and God used him to write so that these intricate details could be put out there for us. Now, that doesn't mean we share all those intricate details with, with everyone else when we're talking about the gospel. Just like you weren't given all those details, you were given the simple gospel. But afterwards, then you can learn about some of those things. But look how, how difficult it gets. Let me keep reading from verse 24 and on. He says, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. And you could go on. He just keeps saying a lot of stuff. But he mentions righteousness. He mentions law. He mentions justification. He mentions propitiation. He mentions blood. He mentions the forbearance. He, all of those types of things. Yeah, the, the gospel is very intricate. But you don't need to get into all that. When someone showed you how to use the computer, did they really try to talk to you about that computer language? You know, the computer language is 0, 1, 0, 1. All the, it's, I mean, it's amazing. Do you realize it's all written out of zeros and ones? Did they, did they explain all that to you? How in the world could you use a computer if you don't know that? Simple. None of us really know it, do we? We just use it. And that's how it is with the gospel. We have to understand some things. We have to understand the fact that we need it because we're sinners. We have to understand the fact that, that even though God is holy and he's going to punish that sin, he did punish it on Jesus. And we just need to receive that by faith, that Jesus did die for me, provide for my sins. That's what we need to do. Going back to the illustration of the car, just drive the car. Don't worry about all the other uh, intricate things. Have you ever looked at your car's uh, manual on how to fix all the stuff? Those things are like that thick. You pay big bucks for them. Mechanics have to have those in order to do a lot of things they want. But we, we don't have to do all that stuff. Just let the car get you to where it's supposed to get you, right? 
And, and that's what we do. We know some basic things we have to do to take care of it, but just learn, just, just use it the way it is. Now, we pastors uh, have a great privilege, and that is that we get to study the scriptures and go in even deeper, and we get to teach it. You, you think of the Great Commission. Great Commission talks about going, reaching people with the gospel. Then it talks about then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever Jesus has commanded. You see? But it's the, the going part, the, 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 the gospel part is, is the first part, and it can be very simple. And then after that, you worry about the other details. That's what we need to do. I think sometimes we scare ourselves to death, worrying about all the things that we don't know. But what do you know? If you know Jesus as your Savior, you know everything you need to know to be a witness of the gospel to other people. In fact, I would encourage you to keep it simple. I'd encourage you to don't give directions like I did earlier. Make it simple. Stop sign left, three lights left. We're there. We're at Burger King. Now the question is, do you really want to be at Burger King? That's the other thing, but still, there you go. Uh, we need to share, and, 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 and we'll learn more as we go. We'll learn more about what's called progressive sanctification. That means just growing more every day. Every day becoming a little bit more like what Jesus wants you to be. Uh, we, we learn all those, but you don't have to dump all that on people as you're trying to share with them about these things. So keep it simple. God, man, Christ, faith. God loves us, but he's holy. We're sinners and we deserve punishment. Jesus paid our penalty for us, and we receive that forgiveness by believing. That's faith. That's, that's a pretty simple gospel. Uh, we need to share about it. Well, what about their questions? What about when they ask things that I don't know? Well, so what? Haven't you ever said to anyone, boy, I'm not sure. Let, let, me, let me go look into that for you. I do that all the time. I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Let me go back and, and look that up. I mean, not just uh, uh, religious things, but even other areas. If you don't know, say, I'll get back with you on it. A lot of times when people throw questions out, it's a smoke screen anyway. A lot of times they're just trying to get you off tax. But, but if you still take it seriously enough to say, I'll get back with you on that, but what about this? I'll even do that sometimes when I know the answer because I'm thinking that's an hour-long discussion. I don't, you know, we're not getting off track that easy. Good try. Let's go back and keep talking about this. Uh, but eventually, we can talk about it some other time. Don't worry about the things that you don't know. Uh, just get back with them. But right now, we need to be concerned with the idea that we need to go and proclaim. People need to know the facts of the gospel. The facts of the gospel are important. And we just need to be able to be able to share that. Again, if you've got these, th these four things written in your Bible, that's a little road map for you. God, man, Christ, faith. And then you'll be given everything that they need to know in order to get saved. They can learn all the other stuff later with the rest of us. That's why we go to church, by the way. We'll spend the rest of our life learning the other stuff. Uh, so let's don't worry about that there. Let's share the facts of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for opening our eyes to the gospel. And Father, we realize that that, that has to happen anyway. None of us are are clever enough to talk other people into being saved, but your spirit has to open their hearts to the gospel. But Lord, help us to be willing to be a part of the process and to be uh, able to share uh, these basic things about how to have eternal life. And Father, we pray that your spirit would be at work. We pray that you would use our words. We pray that you would uh, use our opportunities. Uh, to draw people to the Savior. Lord, we live in a wacky time in our country right now, and everything is in flux, and I have to believe that there's lots of people around us that are in flux as well, and it may be the right time for a harvest. Help us, Lord, to be a part of that. Be some of your harvesters out in the field. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like us to end with this last song, Here Am I, Lord.